Why, good to have you all here. So glad you are part of this thing called Village Church. Good to have you at all of our sites. Good to have you online. My name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, man, we are in the middle of a series right now called The Nine Keys to Happiness. And, uh, and we are hitting, uh, if you have a booklet, uh, hopefully you got this week one and they're available to you at our sites. Uh, if you're a note taker, today is going to be a day where you will be happy because I actually have points just crazy, never have points. I just kind of make this stuff up as I go. Just kidding, I really don't do that. But I do have points to actually, so if you got this, take it out, write stuff down. If not, make sure you grab uh, one of these on your way out and use it for the rest of this series. Really good to have you here. Uh, we have been talking about the nine keys to happiness and saying that happiness is kind of the thing that drives all of our lives. It's what drives most of the decisions that we make in life. And let me start this sermon um, with, with this text, okay? So this is from Ephesians chapter 5. So just kind of get the vision of what the Apostle Paul is trying to say here as we unpack uh, the next three keys to happiness today. It says this, Ephesians 5 verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragment offering and sacrifice to God. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that's an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And I want you to understand something. This is the vision that Christianity gives to you. What we have adopted in our culture today is a version of Christianity where it's all about just what you believe. It's about certain doctrines. It's about certain truths. It's about being more right than the next person. The problem with that is Christianity doesn't let you stop there. It says that actually Jesus has a much bigger vision for your life. And it's a way of being human in the world. It's actually a way of being, a way of living. There is much to do in the context of your Christian life, not just a bunch of stuff to believe. And this is what we got to understand. We have this desire to get happiness, this desire to get joy, this desire to get delight. And what we've been saying in this series is we tend to go after those things, ultimate fulfillment in our life, by finding a good boyfriend, by getting a good job, by making sure I marry right, make sure I get the right friends, make sure I get enough money, make sure I look beautiful, make sure I look intelligent, make sure I get the right education. All of these things start to define you and what we forget is that this kind of happiness we're talking about, as we've been saying, doesn't come from life situations or life circumstances or life fulfillment. It comes from soul fulfillment. That you need something actually deeper than finding these things because these things actually are fleeting and the circumstances change in our life. So C.S. Lewis says this, The sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find the place where all the beauty came from. Not in the song... Not in the smell of the flower or the relationship. It came through those things, but that wasn't the thing itself. There's something behind all of that. And what we've been saying is the something behind all of that is a someone. That Christianity is not an idea. It's not a religion. It's not a set of principles. It's not a set of even beliefs. It's actually about God himself. It's about what God has done to save and reconcile humankind to himself and give us ultimate fulfillment. And what we tend to do, and here's the thing that our culture tends to do, and maybe some of you, most of us at some point in our life, we tend to want to answer the question of our deepest longing by going and doing the things ourselves and just trusting our instinct that we know better than God. And this is the problem. Never trust your instincts. Your instincts are awful. Right, Your instincts are driven by your own selfishness and narcissism and sinfulness. And so you're going to be, I mean, I, when I go to the, the, the store and my wife has told me very specifically to get something at the store, it's when I st start trusting my instincts that things usually go wrong. 
right? She has said, pick up this and I get to the shelf and that's not exactly. And then what I start do, I start troubleshooting. Don't troubleshoot, Mark. It always goes awful because I never get the right stuff. My buddy jumped in the shower uh, a while ago, years ago, and he said, hey, I'm going to take a shower. You get some, we're going to have a barbecue. We're going to barbecue some burgers. Go down to the fridge, get the lettuce all torn up and ready, and get the tomatoes ready. We're going to kill this barbecue. So I did that, and I opened his fridge, and nothing was really like there. So I started troubleshooting, and he came down, and everyone starts coming over. He's like, what are you doing? You just cut up a red pepper. That's not a tomato. I'm like, oh, sorry, bro. And then he's like, okay. And then he looks over, he's like, what? That's not lettuce, that's cabbage. What? So my troubleshooting instincts are awful and so are yours when trying to answer the deep questions of your life. When you're trying to figure out how to get ultimate fulfillment, you go after instinct. And yet, here's what Christianity would tell you. Don't go after instinct. God has already told us what to do, how to believe, how to get this actual fulfillment that we're all seeking. And the question of our lives, are you gonna trust yourself, your instinct, your uncle, your buddies on social media, or are you gonna trust the word of God itself, which has already laid this out for you? It's already told you to believe this way, walk this way, live this way in order to get fulfillment. And so today we've talked about from Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, and now the next three, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I am going to cover all three of these today. <laughs> We're going to try our best. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Here, it's all over the Bible. Let me give you a bunch of passages. Luke chapter 6. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. Matthew chapter 7. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians chapter 6. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Ephesians 4. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. 1 Thessalonians 5, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, finally all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Proverbs chapter 12. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. A good word. Be good. Be kind. Think of these concepts. This should be the shortest sermon ever. Because it's so obvious. Be kind and be good. It's like... Duh! Of course be kind and be good. What are your other options? Be mean and a jerk and evil? Be a nasty person, a mean person, and yet, kindness and goodness, we are not. Kind and good are really hard. It sounds like the kind of thing you should hear coming to a church. Those of you watching online, you're scrolling the internet and you come, oh, I'm, this is a church service. I'm going to watch it. And this guy's talking about being kind and good. Sounds like the church I grew up in. Moving, on. It sounds so simple and basic. And yet we don't do it. We struggle so hard to be kind and to be good, don't we? Now, I uh, basically just should pray right now and be done. Be kind and good. Good night. Go on with your day. Go on with your week. 
Don't be that person. Be the person. And yet we struggle. And I started thinking, why do we struggle? How can I be practically helpful other than just repeating, be kind and be good to everybody and then pray and go home? Because it's so obvious this is one of the keys to happiness and fulfillment in your life. And I started thinking about why is it that we struggle so hard to be kind and to be happy? And this is where your points come in. So if you have pens, you can get ready to write or you can write them later. Okay, number one, we lack self-awareness. No one sees themselves as not kind and good, right? This is, this is the matrix that we live in. We can't get out of the, like, if we murder someone, we're like, oh, yeah, I, that's a sin. Definitely murder that guy. And it's clear, but, but how many of us go, I'm not a kind person. I'm not a good person. Uh, Dallas Willard, the philosopher, pointed out years ago, he said, uh, we, we have a kind of lack of self-awareness where we're, we, we might admit that we lie, but we won't admit that we're liars. Right? And, that's, and yet Jesus goes, how, how would you being evil, even though you're evil, you give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father give good gifts to you? And we run right to the heavenly father being good versus he just threw something out about you. <laughs> you're evil. How would you, even though you're evil, you give good, what? Jesus, exegesis of your own soul and your own identity begins with the default assumption that you're actually not a good person naturally in and of yourself. You are evil. And that evil, the reality is, we can be that way to other people. We can be evil. We can be rotten. We can be nasty. We can be mean. If you doubt this, just go online. And go on. You know where the greatest gathering of human beings is? The comment section on YouTube. This is the best of us. This is the absolute best of us. I mean, the best version of humankind has gathered to comment on YouTube. See the nastiness of people online. Scroll your so scroll Instagram, scroll Facebook, scroll Twitter. The, the, this universe is filled with humankind, and they're nasty. They're mean spirited. As simple as it may sound to tell everybody that one of the keys to happiness in the, in the Christian story is kindness and goodness, I think it might be one of the most needed countercultural revolutionary ideas in our culture in this moment. Because we're all mean and nasty to each other, hiding behind our keyboards, being mean and critical, and, and it's shriveling our soul. If you want to know, I, I mean, I... Uh, I, um, there was, uh, I think it was about a year, year and a half ago, um, the, the actor Chadwick Boseman, who, who plays the Black Panther, for those of you who have seen the Black Panther, he, uh, of course, he played the Black Panther a bunch of years ago, four or five years ago, and then about a year and a half ago, whenever it was, he, there was an uh, award show, and he got up and he did this presentation, and he looked really skinny, and, and people just jumped online and said, What's happening with Chadwick Boseman? Look at this loser. He looks like a meth addict. What happened to his muscles? He looks homeless. Look, I, does this guy take care of himself? This isn't my hero. What happened to the Marvel hero Chadwick Boseman? What happened to the Black Panther? Just ripping into him. Hundreds, thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands of comments. And then a few months later, he dies of cancer that he'd been fighting for four years in secret because he hadn't told anybody. Um, you guys know Robin, Robin Williams years ago, took his own life. You look at a guy like that and you would think on the outside, this is the happy, he's one of the greatest comedians of all time. He's the greatest comedic actors of all time. He does nothing but make other people laugh all the time. And yet my buddy, um, ran a church in Vancouver for years, and Robin Williams would come to Vancouver oftentimes to shoot movies. And he would say that when he was in town shooting movies, he would come to his church on Sundays, and every time he came, you know what he did? 
he would go to the front of the church and go to the altar and sob uncontrollably. See, here's why kindness and goodness matters. You have no idea what people are going through. You have no idea what the people around you in these seats are going through right now. You have no self-awareness and you have no awareness of the real world around you and the struggle people are going through. And in order to remedy that, God says, let me give you a new default setting versus being critical, nasty, mean, and negative. Kindness and goodness assume people are going through the worst. Assume that they may not need your smart alecky comment. Sorry, I didn't want to get myself fired. <laughs> um, like they might not need you. That funny little, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You don't have to always make that comment. You don't have to always complain. You don't have to always be critical. You have no idea the stress and pressure that people are going in in their lives. Why don't you assume they might need kindness? They might need goodness. This is what God's laying out for us. Assume that people might need a positive force versus a negative force in their life. And the people that follow Jesus are the ones who bring the kindness into the world. Okay, secondly, why do we struggle with kindness and goodness? I think we think sometimes we need not be kind and good in order to accomplish great things in the world. We see kindness and goodness and think weakness. We think if I want to be an influencer, if I want to actually change the world, impact the world, then being kind and good is a really slow, weak way of getting there because we see leaders and influencers who are nasty and mean and loud, and so we think that's the way you get anything done in this world. And you couldn't be more wrong. The reality is, think about Jesus, all right? Jesus, the ultimate influencer. Even secular people recognize that Jesus Christ is the most popular, influential person who has ever lived, bar none. 2,000 years after his life, the entire world has changed because of him. 89 chapters we have in the Gospels. 89. There's only one time that Jesus Christ tells us about his own heart in all four Gospels and in 89 chapters. And here's what he says about it. I am gentle and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly. Man, um, you guys heard of the show Ted Lasso? All right. Ted Lasso won like all the Emmys this year. But Ted Lasso is a show about a guy who's a soccer slash football coach from America, goes over to the UK to run this UK football team. Of course, everybody hates him because he's American, he doesn't know anything um, in the show. I'm not saying I believe that. Um, and, uh, and he runs this soccer team. But the funny thing is, he's not the average coach that kicks chairs around and yells at everybody and he's nasty. He actually runs his team and influences the world by being kind and nice and polite and loving. And it's, it's really strange to see on a show because if I went in and pitched you a show, I said, okay, here's the concept of the show. There's a guy and he's super gentle and lowly and meek and he loves everyone and he gets everything done with joy and a smile. You'd be like, okay, where's the conflict? This guy's not going to get anything done. This show's not going to be any good. And yet, it's one of the most watched shows on Netflix. And it's actually it won all the Emmys. Why? Because our world is desperate for the kind of influence that comes not by meanness, but by kindness. By goodness. Can we decide to be a people who flicks a switch in our mind? Because here's the thing. Like, okay. So I publicly speak for a living. I'm going to try to give an illustration of this from my own life. There are certain people, when you're a public speaker, that you tend to look at when you're speaking in any given situation. Uh, because, I'm just going to be honest with you, um, 
some of you look like you ain't happy. All right? I'm just going to be honest. Some of you just look, and if you are happy, you should tell your face. Because when I look at you, you don't look happy. All right? You do not look kind. You do not look like you're having a good time. You look like someone dragged you here, and you hate your life, and you don't like me. Okay, so. But then there are some people where it's like, that's, that's a face I go to. Because I know that they're going to be giving me back. Now, I'm not, they're giving me back smiles. They're giving me back positivity. They're giving me back goodness. They're giving me, now, they might not be listening to any word I'm saying either. But it's still helpful to me. They might be totally zoned out. It's like, hee, hee, hee. Right? It's like, I'm going to talk 40 minutes about hell. Right? It's like, that's weird. But it's a go-to when you need about, like, this is, there's staff meetings where I'm up in front of the staff, and I'm talking in front of the staff, and I got to be honest with you. I look at some of the faces, and it's like, I'm discouraged. So then there's about three or four different staff that I always look to them because they don't look miserable. That's the way to be influencers in the world, guys. People are looking not for the critical face, the nasty face, the face that's going to come at some angle because I want to look smart. They're looking at the face and going, I, I, in, I want goodness. Can I get goodness? Can I get kindness? Um, it is the way to defeat evil in the world, by the way. Inside of ourselves and in the world at large. Um, you guys know I'm big Tolkien fans. One of the big themes in The Hobbit, in The Hobbit movie, there's this great moment where Gladriel asks Gandalf why she's bringing the hobbits with him to try to defeat this evil. And he says, yeah, you know, the other wizards, they think that the only thing that's going to defeat evil in the world is power. But that's not what I've found. He says, I have found that acts of love and kindness are the things that keep evil at bay. In Lord of the Rings, at the end, all the hobbits, everyone in Middle Earth bows to the four hobbits. Why? These hobbits are useless. They're tiny little creatures running around, and yet the whole kingdom bows to them. Why? Because they were the kindness, the goodness, actually is the thing that defeated evil in the end. And the whole kingdom bows down, which every time I see it makes me cry because I think of Jesus when he says, the what? The first will be first? Is that what Jesus teaches? He goes... The first shall be what? Last. And the what? The last shall be first. All those non-influencers, all those people you never heard of, that never changed the world, that were never nasty, that were never mean, they went along in kindness and goodness and gentleness and lowliness of heart. In the end, they're the winners. They're the ones who actually defeat evil because, like Jesus, they absorb it in themselves and they don't create two sins where there was just one. Think of the Martin Luther King Juniors of the world. What are you going to do to defeat hate? Well, hate can't do that. Hate can't defeat darkness. He said only love can do that. And he gave his life for that. He absorbed the evil. He got assassinated for his cause. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, same thing. Absorbed the evil, taking it out of commission. Now, I know the, why we don't do kindness and goodness, because it's risky that people are going to walk all over you. You're going to look weak to the world and look naive. But that's okay. I know another guy who looked really weak and naive to the world. In fact, Colossians 2 says that the powers killed him. Think about when you watch those movies about Jesus suffering and dying. How often you look and go, oh man, he's, he's the power guy. No, he's the, he looks weak in those moments. And yet, his weakness and commitment to goodness, even though it cost him his life, is the thing that defeated evil in the end. Behind the veil, there was something else going on in the universe. A guy named uh, Christian Smith writes this. He says, Jesus' resurrection was not about the fate of a worthy man. It concerned the status of goodness in the universe. 
offering evidence that goodness has power, indeed, ultimate power. Jesus was goodness incarnate, and in his resurrection, his goodness triumphed. If Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, had been the end, the goodness Jesus embodied would, be, would have been beautiful, yes, but how significant would it have been? A fragile blossom afloat on the world's torrential stream, soon to be drowned. How relevant is goodness if it has no purchase on reality, no power at its disposal? See, but it does. That's the point. We think kindness and goodness aren't going to get you anywhere, and yet it's the fruit and the flourishing of a life. That's what Paul, why Paul lists it in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. Because here's the thing, in the, in the face of difficulty, what we tend to do is think our way ahead, our way toward influence, our way toward success is, is to react and to actually do like more of the, uh, like the Braveheart way of doing it. Like, like that's a movie that's satisfying. Why? Because the guys, the British, right? The British, they, they do these awful things. They rape and murder Braveheart's wife. If you haven't seen this, guys, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm ruining this, but this is like 1995, so I'm sorry. Uh, they brutalize his wife, and then what if the movie just ends and Braveheart goes, well, you know, we all got to be kind. They'd be like, wow, that movie sucks. But it doesn't end there. He puts the paint on, and there's that super crazy, creepy, weird scene where he just comes in slow-mo on the horse, and all the music's like, and it's like, and he's riding the horse, and the camera's all slow, and he's like, and he's madness in his eyes, man. He is like jacked up, and you know what's happening. And he pulls the swords out, and British people start dying. <laughs> and just slaughters them, and it's satisfying. So satisfying. And that's our, hear me now, instinct. That's how to get influence. That's how to get power. And yet, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart, and I let evil do its worst to me. And that becomes the paradigm for our lives. Hate can't be defeated through hate. It has to be responded to with kindness and goodness. Has there ever been a time where we've needed kindness and goodness more? My uh, daughters, uh, my second daughter is now getting on uh, Instagram. We're just kind of, we do this process with her, a rite of passage where we explain it all. And they, they do this mom-daughters weekend thing when they turn 13. And Aaron takes any, the kids away to something that they love. And they talk about womanhood and they talk about it. it's kind of this, this moment and they talk about social media and how to use it and how it all works. And I'm sitting there as a dad and I'm just terrified because what a nasty place to be criticized, to be DM comments about yourself, to people to throw things in comments for the whole world to see just, just with all the potential in the world to shrivel your soul. And yet, this is the world we live in. All right, I have a third reason why this is hard. Um, I think we've overlearned the Protestant Reformation, which means we've, we've overcorrected the call to um, action and living a life in a particular way that follows what God is, has for you versus I just have to believe some stuff. I just have to have faith. And so if I have faith then I don't have to have a life that follows up faith. I can have faith and be a nasty person. And this is where we get people in the present day who are so jacked up arguing for truth that they think being good and kind doesn't matter anymore and they're justified in their nastiness and meanness because they're right and they're right about God and therefore they're better than other people. And it justifies a nasty spirit Complaining, criticism, nastiness in general. They are jerks, but they're jerks for Jesus, and they're okay with that. 
I'm wrestling, I'm going to go after this, I'm going to go after that, and so I can be a jerk to anybody because I'm fighting for truth. And yet, Jesus comes along and he goes, oh guys, what a bunch of losers. Sorry, he didn't say that, that's my paraphrase. Uh, <laughs> here's, here's what he actually said. See, when you read Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to people exactly like that who have done that exact trade. They're called who? The Pharisees. They are, they're more right than anyone in the culture theologically. And yet they're the biggest jerks in town. So Jesus just spends chapter after chapter going, guys, what is your problem? And at one point he says this to them. You have strained out a gnat, a little bug, out of your water, and you've swallowed a camel because you've gone after these things, but you've lost the bigger issues of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And so you're losers. Again, that last part's me. You've, you've missed what God has actually called you to in your life altogether, and you've justified it all along. And Honestly, guys, I think there needs to be some repentance around this. In my life, in our church's life, in the ch I'm not going to speak on behalf of the church in Canada, but I would c call and challenge the church in Canada, the church in North America itself, to repent of the idea that my life is justified in being nasty, mean, cruel, and arrogant because I'm only going after truth, and truth is all that matters. That is not what Galatians 5 just said a flourishing life is. Think of the list. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Okay, so you need some motivation, some of you. I think you need some motivation. Why should I be good? Why should I be kind? So I'm going to give you two or three different motivations. Again, got points. You can write them down. Here's a big motivation. Um, obedience to God. <laughs> now, I want to flex on this one for a second because some of you... Uh, being obedient to God, because God says, here's what I want you to do, is, doesn't really motivate you enough. And I was trying to get into why is that in our life, because I find the same thing. And I, and I think I found something, I think I thought of something very interesting. So last week when I was preaching on patience, I ran across this Bible passage that talked about the patience that God has toward us. And then that led me to 1 Peter where 1 Peter talks about the idea that a whole bunch of people are like, okay, Peter, if God really exists, why doesn't he destroy the world? The world's so evil. Why doesn't he come back? I don't understand. And Peter's answer is because he wants everyone to repent, meaning he, yes, of course God's jacked up and ready to finish all this, but he wants you to repent and he wants your friends to come to know Jesus. In fact, if Jesus Christ had come back to earth in 1996, I would have been done. So I'm thankful that he's waited to at least 2021 to do that. And that's Peter's argument. He says, it's patience. It's not that God doesn't understand what's going on. It's a, and, and I started thinking about this and the fact that we misunderstand. This is very important. Listen to me. We misinterpret the patience of God and make it think that he's okay with our life the way it is. So here's what I mean. In college, I think I've told you guys this before, but I thought of this. In college, my buddy came to me with an Old Testament exam. We were very tired. We were very busy. We had like 100 different essays we were doing. And he said, listen, I got an exam. This is like I'm 19 years old. I got an exam from last year's Old Testament class, and I have it, and I think we should just study it, and maybe we'll get 60% because we'll be able to, maybe he'll use some of the same stuff he asked last year, and we can memorize it. And it was like, okay, great. So, I struggled. I was like, wait a minute. So we get over to his house. It's like 10 at night. I'm like, wait a minute. We're going to memorize last year's Old Testament exam? Yes, yes. And I, I had a moral dilemma. And I'm like, I don't know about this. This feels like cheating. And his argument, my buddy's argument, was this. No, no, no. Listen. I know people who did this like 10 years ago. And they're in ministry now and everything's going fine. And that was enough for me. <laughs> I was like, yep, all right. 
And so we studied that thing every, every nook and cranny of that thing. Boom, boom, I can still see the answers. It was multiple choice. And we get there, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and we sit down. And I look down at the sheet, and it's the exact same exam. And all I hear from the other side of the room is my buddy. He, 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 he. Am I, this thing, I was getting wrong answers on purpose. Just like, I, I, there's no way I can ace this thing. My teacher will know something. So here's the logic. There's pastors who did this, and they're fine. And here's, the mis, here's what you've done in that moment. You have misinterpreted the patience of God for affirmation of your life. You think you can be a gossip? You think you can be nasty? You think you can be toxic and get away with it because you woke up this morning? And you think because God didn't come to you in a dream last night, God let you live to today, God has given you a great marriage, health to this point, and money, that therefore everything's fine about the way you're toxic, nasty, and mean to people. But you don't understand. It's only his patience. It's not his affirmation. Because I will tell you this. One day, you will be evaluated on everything you said and did. Everything. You're getting away with nothing. Isn't that terrifying? Now, some of you don't believe me. But I have a Bible passage for that. Listen to Jesus, who says in Matthew chapter 12, some of the most powerful words I remember as a new Christian. I was sitting out and I was trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And I read this passage and I never forgot it. It says this, Matthew 12. And some of you won't even believe this is in the Bible. Go look it up later. But I tell you, this is Jesus, that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment. Listen. For every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted. And by your words you will be condemned. That's Christianity? I thought I was acquitted and condemned based on my faith. I thought I said a prayer at Bible camp. I got baptized. I'm good to go. I can say, do whatever I want because nothing's going to be held against me. Isn't that? We've overlearned this. And you think, well, I woke up this morning and everything's fine. So everything's good. God must not care about my life. Oh, no, he cares. And he's going to bring it up one day. He will mete out judgment perfectly on everybody. By your words, you will be acquitted. Your words. You think you can go around and talk behind people and be toxic and negative and nasty online and you don't think you're going to have every one of those words meted out exactly precisely for you? It's only because you've misinterpreted his patience with you. The reality is, man, if God decided to bring justice, be careful what you ask for, by the way. I remember I was reading uh, someone recently, they said, be careful when you ask for justice because God might actually bring it. Because if he brought justice, you realize none of us would be alive at 1201 tomorrow. And yet he deals with us in grace. Here's the second Motivation I want to give you if you need motivation to be good and kind. It blesses others, which is so obvious. It, it literally changes the world. Um, when I was a 19-year-old kid and I walked into the church, I've told you guys this. I was a mess. I swore every other word. I was a chain smoker. I didn't look or sound like any of the church kids. Uh, I should have been just ostracized. And, and, and some people did. They're just like, this guy's a joke. And, um, and yet... So my buddy, who brought me to church for the first time, uh, he was an adopted kid. He he, he foster kid. He jumped around a bunch of different foster homes, and one of the, these families was was 
uh, trying to legally adopt him and in the middle of that. And he had a bunch of foster brothers and sisters at this home. And I remember I used to go there and hang out. And his parents, um, Bill and Dorothy were their names, and uh, they loved Jesus. And uh, they would raise these kids in the ways of Christ. And when I came in, I was like, I would just come over to hang out or whatever. And there's every reason in the world they should have just said, this guy's going to be a bad influence on you, Rob, get out of here. And what they did instead is they leaned into me. And they would hang out with me and we would joke around and we'd have theological debates and we'd have the text out for two, three hours at a time. And we would just go and they would just love it. Every day we'd come over. And then there was this other guy in the church. His name was Bill too, out of a very uh, diverse group. Um, and uh, just a random guy in the church. And he came up to me. And he would just start leaning into me and talk to me. And he goes, hey, we're going down to this thing called Promise Keepers. You want to come? He's in Detroit. And I was like, sure. I grew up in Toronto. So he's like, yeah, I'll pay for everything. Don't worry about it. And, and we jumped in a van, a bunch of guys. And we drove down. We got lost in Detroit half, half the time. And finally arrived at Promise Keepers. This guy, like, starts mentoring me and pouring into me and opening up the text and teaching me to pray and teach me about this. This guy's, like, 25, 30 years older than me. And I actually thought about both of those people yesterday. And you got to understand something. Why are people 30 years older than me hanging out with me, pouring into me? Is this what we do? Do we recognize that when Paul, in, in, in 1 Timothy and Titus, when he looks and he says, older women, I want you to mentor and pour into the younger women. Is this happening anymore in the church? Are people hanging out with younger generations and saying, let me show you. Because here's the problem. I, I, I hang out with a lot of married people and they're all just making the same dumb mistakes as each other and we're learning nothing. We're just banging it. We're just like, yeah, you got that problem. I got that problem. Sweet. Instead of going, hey, maybe we should go talk to someone 20 years older than us. Smarter than us. They've already been through it. These people poured into me and that kindness, that Pure goodness, undeserved toward me, changed the very direction of my life. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those people, those seemingly irrelevant people, old people, they know nothing. And this dumb kid who's a waste and no, not worth spending my time and energy pouring into. And that kindness and goodness changed the entire direction of my life. It blesses and changes the world, and it blesses and changes us because it changes us from the inside. Let me give you the third and final one, um, motivation. you got to be, and here's the thing about this. You've got to be super intentional about being kind and good, which is kind of crazy to say because it should be a default setting that we're kind and good, but it's not a default. Yesterday, I was driving to the Salvation Army to drop off a whole truckload of stuff, and I got there, and I was trying to get in, get all my stuff, and there was this lady running around, and she's screaming for her dog, right? She's lost her dog. I don't know where her dog is, and she's running around just screaming the name, and I was busy. I was in a hurry, and usually... I'm like, get this stuff out of here. I got to go pick up this. My wife's got me doing 14 different things. I got to go here. I got to go there. I got to and I'm, and I'm trying. And so I get in the car. I get rid of all this stuff. I get in the car to go. And I look at this lady. And I literally thought to myself, oh, my gosh. I'm preaching a sermon on kindness and goodness tomorrow. And I'm about to leave this lady. So then I'm like, I get in my car. I start to drive. And it's like that moment where God's like, haven't you read the Good Samaritan, you idiot? I don't care how busy you are, priest man. So there I am driving around White Rock screaming, Patches! Patches in my car! Because that stuff changes the world. And I didn't find her dog, but I'm just saying, hypothetically, it could have been really good. Dallas Willard says this, experiences don't change our character. Transformation of character comes only through learning how to act in concert with Jesus Christ. Character is formed and transformed through action. So what do I think about when I think about kind and good people? I think about people who are generous with their time, with their money. Those are kind, good people. People who are actually, they step up like, like, um, like uh, we're having uh, uh, Thanksgiving uh, dinner, 
and uh, we're having literally 30 people to my house for Thanksgiving dinner, and, uh, and I'm, I got to go out and get tables and chairs and glasses and plates, and we have to rent all this stuff in order to have all these people over, and I'm like, gosh, so, so here's the difference between my wife and me, Right? I am doing this task with 30 people, and half, I don't even know half these people, so now I'm going to be on the whole time. And it's like, in my brain, having 30 people over for Thanksgiving, here's what it does. It's money. Ching, 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 ching. Out the door. That's what's in my head. My wife, her mentality is, these are 30 people without families in Vancouver at all. We're going to hang out and love them and bless them. See, that's the difference. She's kind and good. And I'm a loser. I'm an awful, evil person who's into me, right? I did so tiring. And yet, one of those things makes the world better, and one of them makes it darker. Another thing that kind, good people do is they tend to always find the best in everybody. Is that you, or do you just do the opposite? Like, I know people who are kind and good, it's like, yeah... I can't, you know, I, I can't believe that guy murdered someone. I mean, he went on a killing spree, murdered a whole bunch of people. That guy's a, wow, a jerk, evil, terrible. And they're like, yeah, but you know, we've all had bad months. <laughs> what? Could happen to any of us. <laughs> really? Could it? Another thing about kind and good people is they don't have to be the center of attention they don't have to be the loudest, funniest person in a room. They don't have to be the cool one. It's not about them. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They don't have to always win the argument. They're kind and they're good. Now, who are you supposed to be kind and good to? Everybody, always. My wife gets me in a lot of trouble and delays things by doing this constantly. We were out with some friends. We were having a meal somewhere, and they sat down, and the friend said, I'm so glad just the four of us are here. I want to talk about something we're super excited about. We're just going to have some peace. And the server came up and talked to us, and my wife goes, 40 questions. Where are you from? How long have you been here? Where did you go to school? And I'm telling you, five minutes into this thing, the guy looks at me. He's like, dude, we got we to gotta cut her off. I'm like, I know. This is what happens. We, we can't do anything. He's like, I just... I just said, I'm here to enjoy the two of us. Thank goodness that there's no distraction. And the lady leaves, and my wife goes, okay, everyone's, everyone's like, no, no, you can't do that again. She's like, do what? Ask her any questions, show any interest, make eye contact, nothing. <laughs> Kindness and goodness. It's a challenge for us all, but in the end, it's what changes the world in ways that we'll never know or never understand. I will leave you with this. There's a guy named Mark Batterson. He's one of the most famous Christian writers in the world. He sells, I don't know how many copies of his books, a lot. He's, in, he's a pastor out in Washington, D.C. He tells this story in the end of one of his books called uh, Praying Circles Around Our Children. And I leave it with you as a picture of you never know what being kind and good and going out of your way can actually do for the world. He says this, Our family started attending Calvary Church when I was in the eighth grade. It was already a mega church with thousands of members. But the pastor had an amazing memory for names and faces. If you met him once, he would remember your name forever. Despite the size of the church, he had a hospitable spirit that gave him an air of accessibility. Maybe that's why my parents felt like they could call him at 2 o'clock in the morning after my doctor issued a code blue and half a dozen nurses came rushing into my ICU. I thought I was taking my last breath at 13. My mom stayed by my side while my dad called information and got a home phone number for the pastor. In less than 10 minutes, he arrived at my bedside in his black double-breasted Superman suit that I would later swear he slept in. He was a large man with large hands. They looked more like meat hooks than hands. And when he prayed for someone, his hands would envelop that person's head like a skull cap. When he laid his hands on my head, I remember thinking, there's no way God isn't going to answer this prayer. 
He had a familiarity with God that was disarming. He had a faith in God that was reassuring. He could have called the staff member to make that visit. He didn't. He could have waited until morning. He didn't. He sacrificed a full night's sleep to pray for a 13-year-old kid who was fighting for his life. Little did he know that this 13-year-old kid would one day marry his daughter. Little did he know that this 13-year-old kid would one day give him his first grandchild, a colicky baby boy named Parker. There's no way he ever could have known, but that's the glorious mystery of prayer, isn't it? You never completely know who you're praying for and who is praying for you. You never know how or when God will answer your prayers, but you can be sure of this. Your prayers will shape the destiny of your family for generations to come. And if you're willing to interrupt your sleep cycle, if you're willing to get on your knees and intercede for your family, God will answer prayers long after you are long gone. Lord, I pray that we would have the kind of faith that would say, that would have such a long-term perspective on our actions in this life that we would recognize that kindness and goodness, while not feeling like it's getting us results in the moment, give it long enough. And you realize it's exactly what you're using to change the world in ways we could never comprehend or understand. And for all of us who fail at this, thank you that the kind one and the good one came to earth, Jesus died on a cross for our sin, rose again from death to give us life. And we know we fail at this every day. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would do a work in us who've trusted in Jesus to be kinder and better coming out of this day for the sake of the world, for the glory of God, and for the good of people. In your good name we pray, amen.